In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go now to Judges chapters 10 and 11. And so we're going to go through two chapters on this video. These videos love to go through chapters of the Bible. So the goal is to go through the chapter to look at the narrative, biblical narrative, and also the theology. So we can really dig in deep. And so if you like to study chapters of scripture and really look at the theology, this is the channel for you. You, you can go to the playlist and find many videos. So in Judges 10 and 11, the book of Judges wants to underline that this is a time of absolute chaos. And what's happening essentially is the people are going to choose judges who lack wisdom. So we're going to see this characteristic. They will have great strength. They will be great warriors, but they will lack wisdom. So in Judges chapter 10, it talks about two good judges. And notice how not much is said about these good judges. The, the narrator wants to focus on the chaos of this period. That might be one of the reasons. So the two good judges are Tola, who's from the tribe of Iskar, and also Ya'er, who's, or Ja'er from, from Gilead, which is east of the Jordan River. And so the Israelites, right after the careers of these two good judges, they fell right back into sin. So notice what the narrator does. He, he underlines the series of events that continually takes place. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served Baal and Ashtaroth fertility gods. They served the deities of Sidon. They served the deities of Moab. They served the deities of the Ammonites. They served the deities and gods of the Philistines. They abandoned. They forsook the Lord. Notice how the Israelites will serve any deity but the one true God. They're serving all these false gods. Notice how five of them are mentioned here in chapter 10. So they served five false deities, a metaphor is used, God's anger burned. It's, it's a metaphor that expresses something in a human way so that we can understand this. And so some scholars will, will talk about how this is like an anthropomorphic description of God's anger. But his anger burned and the people were literally sold into the hand of their enemies. The image of being sold into the hand of their enemies, it, it underlines how the exodus has been reversed. And so it wants the reader to see how the exodus has been reversed because they served false gods rather than serving the one true God, which is all part of God's plan for biblical freedom. So they were under the service of their enemies for a total of 18 years, and then they cried out to the Lord. And so what is so interesting here in Judges chapter 10, also in Judges chapter 12, is that the Israelites actually admit that they have sinned. This is absolutely phenomenal. They're asking for forgiveness of their sins. Is this going to be a lifelong repentance? No, this is actually what you call foxhole repentance. Foxhole repentance is when something really bad happens and you really get sorry for a while and then you go right back into what you were doing. That's called foxhole repentance. So this is not a lasting repentance, although it is an act of repentance. And so you may have looked at my previous videos and I talk about how there's really no repentance. Well, you could argue and say in Judges 10, Judges 12, you do have repentance, but it's really kind of foxhole repentance. It's not lasting repentance, to make a long story short. So they're going to ask God for forgiveness. They're crying out to the Lord, asking for forgiveness. They're admitting that they have sinned, which is all part of repentance. And so what are they going to do? They, they need to choose a warrior who's going to be their leader. Eventually, they're going to choose a man by the name of Jephthah. So the princes, they get together. The sons of Israel were encamped at Gilead. The Philistines were nearby at Mizpah. And so the princes of Gilead, they asked, who is the man that could lead us to fight against the Ammonites? And so they proposed to make this man the head of Gilead. Gilead's an area east of the Jordan, uh, Jordan River. And so the question that the princes posed is important because it provides some insight into this concept of like a warrior leader, which is eventually going to be a concept that's going to continue to be developed, the idea of a warrior king. 
And so we're going to see this concept developed a little bit more in scripture, especially with Saul, uh, when you get to 1 Samuel, and then with David, also in 1 and 2 Samuel. And so who are they going to pick? Well, it's preparing us for the choice of Jephthah. And that's where we that's where we, we pick up in chapter 11. Jephthah was the son of a harlot. Now, this kind of reminds you a little bit of Abimelech. If you remember, Abimelech was the son of one of Gideon's concubines. You find that at the very end of Judges chapter 8, right around verses 31, 30 to 31. And so Jephthah, he's the son of a harlot. And as a result, he was rejected by his fathers, driven from his father's house so that he would have no share in his father's inheritance. Now, you can already start to uh, put together some of the narrative. Here's a guy who's he's driven from the family. And you can imagine he's got a lot of issues that he's wrestling with. OK, and what's really interesting about the judges is. You know, you really look at each of the characters, you can study the characters throughout the whole book, and you can see that a lot of them were wrestling with a lot of issues. So here's a man driven from the household of his mother, and from his father, and he's the son of a harlot. He's going to have some issues that he's dealing with. And so he was a man without a father and without an inheritance. And under these circumstances, one can understand why he became a mercenary warrior. So he fled and he lived in the land of Tob, which means good, but he gathered around himself worthless or empty men. This reminds us a little bit about Abimelech who found worthless or empty men to kill the sons of Gideon. So he's not associating himself with good friends. You can already see where what where part of the problem is. Jephthah became something of this mercenary soldier, but he's like this biblical version of the ultimate warrior, Rambo, or a superhero. This guy is the most incredible warrior you can imagine. And so he so obviously he's going to be a wanted quantity. You can you can figure out what's going to happen. Unfortunately he grew up surrounded by ruthless men. He didn't have a good family background. Uh, but he was an unmatched warrior. So the elders of Gilead, what are they going to do? Are we going to pick a man of good character who can lead us? No, we're going to go get the great warrior to lead us. You see where the problem of having a warrior king leads? So he's not going to be king, but he's going to be leader. So they go seeking Jephthah's help. And look at what Jephthah does. He's not dumb. Jephthah's only request was that he would become their leader based on the condition that the Lord gives him victory over their enemies. So the one beautiful thing about Jephthah is he's, he's not a man with great wisdom, but he does have faith. OK, so he's a man of faith. He just doesn't have wisdom. And so if God gives me this victory, you're going to let me be your leader. So the request is important because the people of Gilead seem to have a lack of faith. And so Jephthah's not only a good warrior, but he's got the faith that they should have had. So seeking the help of warriors instead of the Lord, they should have appealed to God for help. Why, did, why are they seeking a warrior? Instead, they should have turned to the Lord. So there's one of the big problems right there. Um, and so Jephthah underlines that he will accept their invitation if the Lord gives him a victory over the Ammonites. His question is ironic. Jephthah poses the question to the Ammonites. So he asked the Ammonites a question. He's, he's an interesting guy. He's got questions. Look at the question he's going to ask them. He tells them, you can have all the land that your God Chemosh will give you, but we will take all the land that the Lord will give us. How about that, guys? How, how does that sound to you? So his assumption is, of course, God has promised us this land. These are the patriarch, the promises he made to the patriarchs. And by the way, if you read the, the book closely, Chemosh, the God of the, Am Am the Moabites, um, he had already been, they had already been expelled from the land. So the Moabites were expelled from the land temporarily, and they were worshiping this God. So it's kind of like saying, you know, we already know what happened with your God. And by the way, let's just go with this. Whatever your God promises, whatever our God promises, and we'll work that we'll we'll work that out. In other words, it's kind of like saying your God is powerless. Our God has given us this land. So essentially, we're going to take it all. Um, that's kind of the idea of his question. So there is a little bit of faith, a little bit of irony um, and, you know, so forth, maybe street humor. 
And so Jephthah's question underlines the fact that he knows that the Lord will give Israel the land according to the promise which was made to the to the patriarch. So he's got some beautiful faith, but he's got a lot of issues as well. So he mixes faith with irony. So this might explain why Jephthah is considered a hero by Samuel. If you go to 1 Samuel 12, 11, and he's also considered a man of faith if you go to Hebrews eleven thirty two. This is very this is very important. So Jephthah was a man of faith, but what did he lack? He lacked wisdom. Okay, so he's a hero. He's faithful. He's going to triumph over over the enemies of Israel, but he lacks wisdom, and we're going to see how he lacks wisdom. And so just like Gideon, who introduced idolatry into Israel, in a similar way. Uh, Samson, a little bit later on, will allow himself to be tempted by foreign women. Jephthah is going to make an oath that demonstrates all that is wrong during this period. So this reading actually comes up during the cycle of readings. It's read publicly in the church, and people go, what in the world is happening here? This man is going to make an oath, and he's going to say the first thing that walks through this door, I'm going to give to the Lord. And, and after he returns from victory, his daughter is going to walk through the threshold. And he and so people go, what, what in the world is going on here? The, the, the narrator in Judges is trying to show you how wrong this is. He's not approving it. He's showing you how chaotic this period is. He's showing you how out of control this period is. Why? Because the people have not turned to the Lord. Instead, they've turned to the great warrior. And so they put their trust in the great warrior instead of putting their trust in God. And this great warrior does not have wisdom. So it typifies the period of time. It shows you all that is wrong with this period of time when every person did what was right in their own eyes, as many people are living today. So when this reading comes up in the cycle of readings, you can say, no, 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 this shows you what was wrong in the time of Judges. But if you don't know the context, you'll hear this reading and think, what in the heck is going on here? So let's go through this reading, okay, that shows poor judgment. So Jephthah he vows to offer to the Lord anything that, that goes to the threshold of his house if he comes back in victory. And of course, who's going to walk through? His daughter, okay? Uh, that's unfortunate. And so his own daughter walks through. And so let's under, let's look at the narrative style here. The book of Judges often presents very negative situations or gravely sinful situations and provides no commentary at all, assuming that the reader can wrestle with this and logically see the problem. So if you don't know this, you're just going to read the story and think, oh, this sounds like a children's story or something. You'll misread the narrative. But if you understand what the writer is getting at, you'll say, ah, you'll, you'll struggle with it, but you'll start to see what the narrator is showing you in the story. And that's why it's so important to learn how to read scripture correctly. Because if you just pick up this book and read it without knowing this background, you're going to misread the story. So, so thus, I'll read in my notes here, one can already see the problem in Israel spiraling, spiraling out of control. And in this light, one can understand Jephthah's problem. He's an unwilling hero who sought to be something of a king or leader, not really a king, but a leader, rather than really saying, you know, God is our king. God is our leader. Let's turn to him. And so, Jephthah is filled with the Spirit. In verse 11, 29, we are told that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Thus he approached his enemy. Hence, Jephthah was inspired to go into battle and even make an oath. And he went too far in his oath. He went too far, making an impossible, even irrational oath in an attempt to gain victory. This could have been even an act of manipulation. The book of Judges underlines the manner in which the Spirit of the Lord worked in the lives of some judges, especially Samson. However, we should remember that the Spirit of the Lord came upon, upon these figures for just a moment of time, a temporary period of time. They performed heroic actions, and then after that, the Spirit was not present. Here we see that some of them went too far. So what, what was Jephthah's hasty oath. The entire book of Judges is summed up, as I mentioned before, Judges 8, 22 to 23. Gideon speaks about the Lord's kingship, saying, the Lord will rule over us. 
And that, that really prepares you for 1 Samuel 8, 7, when the Lord says that they have rejected me as their king. So this is kind of the interpretive context of the book of Judges and the book of 1 Samuel. God is our king, and the people of Israel have rejected him as their king. If you know that, you'll be able to read the stories and understand them. Unfortunately, the book of Judges is filled with lawless chaos, violence, and it repeatedly tells the reader that every person did what was right in their own eyes. It sounds like how many people are living today, rather than seeking God's wisdom. And the, and the, the books of wisdom literature really provide a beautiful answer to this complete chaos that we see in the book of Judges. So, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, 8, it forbid them to do only that which was right in their own eyes. So they're doing exactly the opposite of what God wants them to do. So in the case of Jephthah, the people sought a warrior who could, who could fight for them rather than being faithful to God. And this warrior, he gave them victory. He gave them what they wanted, but he made this hasty oath and he ended up sacrificing his own daughter. Now, number one, it breaks the law of human sacrifice. If you remember Genesis 23, and you go back and read Genesis 23, I'm sorry, Genesis 22, and, and the whole story of Abraham and Isaac, God is showing us that human sacrifice is a no-no. And then if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, especially Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 19, human sacrifice is a no-no. It's totally forbidden. And so sometimes people read the story and they say, but it seems like, you know, Jephthah, you know, at one sense, he's blessed by God. He has faith. He's doing the will of the Lord. But then at the same time, he's making an oath. He's going way too far on this hasty or rash oath. And he's doing something which is absolutely abhorrent. He's finishing the same way that Gideon finished. Gideon was heroic, but he finished badly. And it's underlining the chaos of this period. And so we see this repeating again with Gideon, Jephthah, and then Samson, another story later. And you'll, you'll see the same thing. A lot of heroism, but a very bad ending. Okay. And it's underlining. There's a lack of wisdom. There's a lack of true devotion to the Lord. There is an inability to repent with a lasting type of repentance. So it really underlines the time period. And when people realize that, they can read the story and say, I see what the narrator's doing. He's showing us what's wrong with the faith of the people. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us that we should not make hasty oaths. And this is very important because on a few occasions, Paul actually makes oaths. You can look up these verses, Romans 1, 9, 2 Corinthians 1, 23, Galatians 1, 20. However, frivolous or hasty oaths are forbidden. And we can see something very similar here with the story with Jephthah as well. And so we finish on that note. It typifies the time period. These heroes who do incredible acts, but unfortunately, they finish badly. And so it's all preparing us for the request for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.